I was chatting with a lot of different clergy colleagues over the week, and we were sort of comparing notes um, about what each of us was going to preach on this Sunday. After all, it is Halloween, and Halloween doesn't always fall on a Sunday. And so one of my friends is preaching about ghosts, <laughs> and another is encouraging everyone to dress up as different Bible characters today during worship, which I thought was pretty fun. We might have to do that sometime. And another, you know, is, is focusing on all Hallowtide and I chimed in and I said, I'm thinking about Martin Luther, which I don't usually do. It surprised me as much as anyone that my conversation partners for this sermon are Martin Luther and Paul. And this surprised me because for the sake of honesty, they are not my favorite theologians. If I were to list my top five, while I recognize that both of them are incredibly significant for our faith, they wouldn't make my top five list. But the spirit leads where the spirit leads. You learn to trust that as a preacher. And this week, the spirit led me to think about reformation. Like I shared in our call to worship this morning, today is not only Halloween, it is Reformation Day. On this day in 1517, the monk Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door of All Saints Church in Wittenberg. We're going to have a lot of church history today, so hang with me. And Luther's act, it actually wasn't as dramatic as we often think. The door of the church was used as a sort of bulletin board. People nailed things to it all the time. So Luther, in nailing those 95 theses to the door of the church, did not set out to create a movement or a new church. He was actually taking part in a tradition called disputation which was a method of debate in the Middle Ages. Luther wanted to spark conversation, yes, and a renewal in the church, but he did not anticipate the wide circulation of his writings nor his eventual excommunication from the Catholic Church. Now, if you can't already tell, I really like church history and liturgical history, and I think the Protestant Reformation is fascinating. Truly, it is so much more interesting than the slice that I was taught in high school. No offense to my European history teacher, who was really quite good. What started as a theological debate blossomed into a political, economic, and cultural revolution. This movement brought the Bible to the people. We sort of take for granted that we can read the Bible whenever we want. But that wasn't the case then. The Bible during the Reformation was translated into the common language and people could read scripture for themselves for the first time. How incredible is that? And the Reformation also became this pushback against oppression. Peasants and poor people began to revolt against the wealth inequality of the nobility system. I could talk about the Protestant Reformation and its influence on the Baptist and UCC denominations for a long time. However, that's not entirely our focus this morning. About 75% of you are very relieved, and the other 25%, we should talk about Reformation sometime later. But I do want to 
think for a moment about those 95 theses, the initial theological issues that were at stake for Luther. As many of us have learned in school or in Sunday school, or maybe from a preacher, Luther wrote against the system of indulgences. It was a practice of the Catholic church at the time, basically a fundraiser. People could buy forgiveness for themselves, for loved ones, even for people who had already died. Indulgences lessened one's time in purgatory and also funded the building of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Luther took issue with this. He took issue with the way that this system exploited poor people and emotionally manipulated believers. In Thesis 86, he writes, why does not the Pope build St. Peter's with his own money rather than with the money of poor Christians? We could swap out a few of those specifics and the same sentence could be written about some of our structures today. Luther felt that the church had strayed from its mission. He saw power being used in inappropriate ways, in ways antithetical to the open arms of Christ. So he did what any of us would do and he nailed his arguments to the door of a church. And the Reformation, it was this massive turning point in history. But it was not the only Reformation of the church institution. This is part of why we have so many Protestant denominations. All of them are, on some level, an attempt to reform the tradition. Reformation is not easy. It is complicated and messy and uncomfortable, but also sometimes necessary. Reformation asks us to grapple with our practices and our principles. It is a process of making over, of reevaluating, and hopefully in doing so, drawing closer to the kingdom of God. Reforming, reformation requires us to re-examine our history, our theology, the figures in our tradition. And so a good example on this day is Martin Luther himself. His later writings are horribly, horrifically anti-Semitic. And those writings directly led to and influenced Nazism. That's a hard thing. And we have to grapple with that. And we have to reform our practices and our theologies, especially those we've inherited that cause harm. And it's in this way that I think reformation is about communal wellness. Thus far in our wellness series, we have focused on individual wellness, but there's also communal wellness how we are well as a community. Reformation leads us to ask, how are we doing as a group? Who are we including? How are we treating one another? Who are we leaving out? Who might we even unintentionally be harming? How can we live closer to God's vision? I think we should regularly be asking ourselves these questions as a church. Indeed, some of these questions might guide our congregational meeting this afternoon as we look back on two full years of church life and discern what comes next. In thinking about this, I was reminded of the congregational surveys that we completed last year. Shout out to Mary for designing and analyzing all of that information. Those surveys illuminated some areas in need of reform. For example, we learned that we need to think more expansively about worship 
so that the diversity we have among us is reflected in our music and our liturgy. We learned that there's some work to do in our relationships to one another, as the hybrid experience can sometimes lead us to feel fractured. That's an area where we can grow into. These are reformation practices for our community wellness, practices that bring us closer to God's vision of who we are as Hyde Park Union Church. Reformation practices that build a community where all are welcomed and where all are celebrated. Similar questions about community and about reform are at the heart of our text from Romans. In fact, this text was a central one for Luther and for the Protestant Reformation. In it, Paul writes to a struggling community directly addressing the divisions that were present. He writes, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Paul is writing about inclusion, and he starts from what I think is an interesting place. He begins this letter by saying that he is not ashamed of the gospel. He is not ashamed of the power of a God who bleeds and suffers humiliation and dies. In our contemporary context, we're sometimes so far removed from that, that it's hard for us to realize how revolutionary that was, how scandalous that was. And here Paul is saying, I'm not ashamed of that. And he makes clear from the very beginning that that's the power that he's drawing on. That's the authority he is drawing on, God's authority. An authority that is wholly different from the power of empire. God's power doesn't come from aggression or oppression or division. It comes from radical, even sometimes scandalous love. So Paul uses this authority to address this ongoing tension in the church, this tension between the Jewish and the Gentile communities. They weren't sure how to bridge their differences, their differences in lifestyle and in religious practice. And there were continuing arguments about which of these communities was the rightful recipient of God's grace. So Paul comes in and says, no, no, that's not how God's power works. That's not how God's love works. God's love is for all people. It is for the Jewish community and the Gentile community of this church. It is for people who do not look the same, for people who do not speak the same language or worship in exactly the same way. And then Paul goes on to write, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. For the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Those are some powerful words. Let's take a moment to recognize what Paul does not say. As with all communication, it's important to listen for what is said and what is not said. Paul does not say that we all need to be the same. He does not reduce the differences between these two communities and these two cultures. Paul fully recognizes that the Jewish and the Gentile communities have distinct practices and distinct points of view. He addresses this in further detail later in the letter to Romans, writing about the importance of upholding the law. 
So Paul's suggested reforms are not about making everyone the same. That's important when we think about reformation, when we think about the reforms in our own church and in the church at large. Reformation can and should make room for difference. What Paul does say is that we have this common thing. We're all human. We're all part of the same human family. And because we are all human, we all sin. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I don't think about the glory of God as something that's far removed from us, as something that's somewhere high above us or somewhere where we can't reach it. I think we all have the glory of God within us. We all have this divine spark that was endowed to us from the moment we were created in God's image. So I think when we fall short of the glory of God, it's when we separate ourselves from that spark. We fall short when we lose ourselves to anything other than that wonderful fact. When we put ourselves down, when we pursue wealth or status above anything else, when we refuse to see that spark in other people, when we neglect God's creation, that's when we fall short, when we're separating ourselves from that glory of God that is within and all around. And we do those things. I do those things. You do those things. Because we're human. It happens. Which is where grace comes in. Listen to Paul again. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption in Christ Jesus. Grace is a gift. We can't earn it. We certainly can't buy it. That's why this text was so important for the Reformation. There's nothing we can do. And there's nothing we can fail to do. We receive grace just for being who we are. And I used to understand this in a shame-based way. I don't know where I picked that up, but I used to really hear this text and feel so ashamed. I felt horrible about falling short. I felt so unworthy. I felt that because I couldn't earn it that I somehow had failed. I understand this differently now. I think this is so liberating, so liberating. There is so much in life that we have to earn, a paycheck, a grade, a new position, or there's things that we're told we have to earn like reputation or respect or approval. It is exhausting. It is a heavy burden, this constant striving to earn and earn and earn. And God just disrupts all of that. God gives us grace. God gives us grace when we sin. God gives us grace when we reform. God gives us grace every single day, no matter what we do. I was talking about this with another friend this week because I was really excited about grace. And she said something so profound. She said, grace, like so many of the best things in life, is free. And then she went on to list some of those things. We were sitting in this coffee shop near my house and we were just exclaiming all of the things that show us grace. We don't earn the trees changing colors outside. We didn't earn that. We don't earn a beautiful sunset over the lake. We don't earn our friendships. We don't earn the joy of a child's laughter. Those are part of our experience just because we're human and because the glory of God is all 
around us. We all have the glory of God within us and the grace of God upon us, and that should lead to a hallelujah, amen. This is the source of our worship and gratitude and love for God. Receiving this and acknowledging this beautiful gift is part of being spiritually well as an individual and as a congregation. Because churches need grace too. Churches don't always get it right. Pastors don't always get it right. Because churches are made up of human beings. But thanks be to God, we have ways to recenter ourselves, to come back to God, to draw ever closer to the beloved community that God has in mind for us. We have the possibility of reformation. And in many ways, I believe that the church at large is in the midst of another capital R reformation. We're being called to reevaluate our theologies and our practices especially those that are harming communities of color and the queer community. We are being called to reform our relationships to our buildings. As for so many of us, the building is larger than the congregation needs. We're being called to rethink how we live in relation to our neighbors of other faith and of no faith. We're being called to articulate our faith principles in a new way because the old ways aren't resonating with everyone. I think, I truly think that 50 years from now, 100 years from now, 200 years from now, we will look back at this time period as another reformation. And that is not easy. It is complicated and messy and sometimes profoundly uncomfortable and anxiety provoking, but it's also hopeful. It's a way of being well, because we are well when we attend to the big sticky questions. We are well when we acknowledge our sin and the ways that we have fallen short. We are well when we build a beloved equitable community. We are well when we receive God's grace. For we all have the glory of God within us and the grace of God upon us. And that is certainly a reason for a hallelujah and an amen.